14. If you would, just turn there. Mark chapter 14 in your Bibles. So we continue looking at the last few days, literally, of our Lord's earthly life. These are indeed the Holy of Holies of Scripture as we get closer and closer to the cross. We're actually changing days. As you know, we slowed down here in this book of Mark. We're all focusing on this one week. And we come to Mark 14. And we're on the last day before his death on Thursday evening. But I want to remind you of where we are. Mark 14, verse 10, we looked at last week. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, one of the disciples went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. It is winding down, you see. Jesus is about to be arrested and taken to his execution. So verse 12, we come to verse 12 this morning. Verse 12, it says, On the first day of unleavened bread... When the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room? in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples. And he himself will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready, prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. So let me give you a little bit of a, of a timeline here. This is Thursday evening. Something very interesting that really adds so much to this story that I learned is, is simply this. There were two different days in which the Jews in Israel celebrated the Passover. Thursday was the day in which the Jews from the north in Galilee held the Passover. And then Friday was when the Judeans in the south celebrated their Passover. And that will make sense. And that will be, you'll see how glorious this is in a few days when we see what happens on Friday, but this is Thursday, and they're already sacrificing the Passover lambs. This whole section that we're going to talk about today centers on this event, this celebration called Passover in the Jewish history. Now, where did this come from? Well, by Jesus' day, they had been celebrating Passover as a national holiday for over 1,500 years. Passover is something that God Himself instituted during the days of Moses. When Moses was to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to go out of there into the Promised Land, uh, God was demonstrating His power to the Pharaoh, to the leader, to show him that He is the one true God of all gods, and the very last judgment that God was going to pronounce upon Pharaoh, because Pharaoh refused to let them go and worship God, was that there would every firstborn of animal and person would be slaughtered by the death angel that night. Unless, unless there had been a lamb that was slaughtered and the blood was painted on the doorpost above the door. When the death angel saw that blood over the door, that angel would literally pass over that house and spare the firstborn child. And so you have God making a covenant with Israel. Every firstborn in all the land that was not a part of God's covenant people was slaughtered. So you have a picture of what was coming in Jesus Christ. Because something very important about that lamb made the death angel pass over the house. It had to be a, an innocent victim, and it was a substitute that averted the wrath of God. 
So that lamb was an innocent substitute and the blood averted or pushed away the wrath of God. So Jews ate and celebrated this Passover meal for thousands of years. Essentially, it was a several course meal and typically they would eat it standing up, wearing their cloaks, their overcoat, already tied around their waist like they're about to leave the room. You know, you go out there, you put on your coat, you're ready to get in your car. That's how they ate the Passover. Because the whole point of it was, you're celebrating and remembering how Israel had to get out of Egypt in a hurry. And so they would eat the Passover meal as if they were ready to leave somewhere. They were ready to go. By the time of Jesus' day, they took it a little more slowly. It was a several hour in length celebration. So this was Thursday night. As I said, the Galilee Jews celebrated on Thursday and the Judean Jews celebrated on Friday. But it says here, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, that is for the northern Jews, the disciples asked him, where do you want us to go prepare for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus has it all planned. He's got it all worked out. It's all set up. He already knows where it's going to be. He's already got the preparations made. He already knows who is going to be hosting them. Again, they don't live in Jerusalem. They're from the north. They're in Jerusalem for the celebration of the Passover. So they had to borrow a house. Wasn't that just like Jesus' life, you know? He had to borrow a donkey. He had to borrow a Passover room. And he had to borrow a tomb. But he only needed it for a few days anyway, right? He had to borrow these things. So, verse 13 says, A man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Now imagine this, folks. This is a city and it's swelling with hundreds of thousands of people. And Jesus says, go out there when you see a guy carrying a pitcher of water. That's the one. <laughs> Isn't that strange? Well, the odd thing was, men didn't carry pitchers of water. Usually it was women that carried pitchers of water. So it would be so unusual, they would know it was him. And so they found this man. He, Jesus told them what to say to him. And they would expect that it would already be in, have been prepared. And so he himself, verse 15, will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. They were ready to celebrate Thursday night, the Passover. And so they prepared it, as verse 16 tells us. So this is a very intimate time. Jesus with his disciples, with all 12 of them, even Judas. Luke chapter 22 tells us that Jesus said, I have eagerly longed to celebrate this Passover with you. So verse 17, when it was evening... He came with the twelve as they were reclining at the table and eating. Jesus said, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and to say to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would, be, it would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So here they are in the middle of the Passover celebration. Okay, This is something, as I said, that takes hours for them. Because in the midst of this whole event, you have things like John chapter 13, where Jesus washes all the disciples' feet. So in the midst of this Passover, there were several courses. And separating the courses, they would have a cup of wine that was doubly diluted. So it was kind of like grape juice. They would have this three times during the meal. They would start out with the wine, and they would eat bitter herbs. And they would have a flatbread um, Something that, that this is something they celebrated with the Passover for years and years and years. Unleavened bread, okay? So it was not like a loaf of bread. It was kind of like what you get at Subway or some restaurant. This flat bread, simple flat bread. And then they would have the second cup of wine. Then they would have the lamb that was already had already been taken to the temple and prepared. Some of it was burned, and some of it was returned to the family to celebrate the Passover. Then during the main course of having the lamb, they would sing what we call the Hallel Psalms. 
which is Psalm 113 through Psalm 119. That's, just, that's not just in the Bible for entertainment. That really is worship music. They would sing those psalms at the Passover celebration. And then they would finish up the Passover celebration by one of the children would ask the question, why is this night special? Why is this night different than all other nights in the year? And one of the adults would speak up and say, because on this night, God himself rescued the people of Israel and spared them from the death angel, preparing us to go and worship God out away from Egypt. So it was a very, very special occasion. I mean, it was something like we consider Christmas to be. It was a big deal. It was the main celebration, the main meal, and the main holiday for the Jewish people for the whole year. <clears throat> so Jesus said he wanted to celebrate with his disciples. <clears throat> Also during the meal, they would take the bread and they would have this paste of fruits and nuts that were mashed together. That's what Jesus is doing here in verse 20. Dipping this bread into the bowl. And he's saying, one of you will betray me, verse 18. Imagine, this is the most intimate time that he's known with his disciples. And he goes and he drops this bomb upon them. One of you is literally going to betray me. One who is eating with me. This is actually just like Psalm 55 talked about. That a, a close friend that somebody walked with in the house of God would betray him. And so he says, he predicts, as perfect as he is, knowing the future perfectly, one of you is going to betray me. And they all said, it can't be me. Not I, is it? It's not me, is it? They all, they all understood that they all had the propensity to do that. But they also knew that they loved the Lord. And how could, how could that happen? How could one of the disciples, one of the inner twelve, betray Christ? He says in verse 20, It is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. Unbelievable. One of his closest friends, Judas, as we know from Scripture, Judas Iscariot would betray him. Even sharing a meal together with these twelve, it's one of them. It's one of them. He says in verse 21. In verse 21, I just you got to get ready for verse 21. Because it is so packed with so much teaching. It says, for the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of Him. So he's saying that it has been written that the Son of Man would die. That the Messiah, the Son of Man, God's Son, would perish. So he's talking about the Old Testament because the New Testament had not been written. So he's referring back to things like Genesis 3 in the Garden of Eden when God promised Adam and Eve that one would come from the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the, quote, serpent, which would be Satan himself. It's a promise. And back in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of God. The Messiah would suffer and, and, and pay for the sins of his people. And then Psalm 22, which talks about a crucifixion years and years and years before it was even invented. So he says, interesting, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. The death of Christ was no accident. It was no, it was not God taking his hands off the wheel and God turning his back and, and then Judas jumps in and kills Christ. The death of Christ is the very reason He came in the first place. The death of Christ is not plan B. It is plan A. It is why He came. It was God's intent and purpose for the Messiah to come and to die. Just as it was written of Him. So we have in that part of the sentence, God's absolute sovereignty. God is in charge of everything that happens in the world, no matter how good it is or how bad it is. And I say that because there's nothing more evil and wicked in the world's history than the crucifixion of the innocent Son of God, Jesus Christ. That was the most evil thing to happen in history. The death of God, the Son. But, he says this, But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Jesus never says, and the Bible never teaches, 
That when God is sovereign over evil, that people are not responsible for that evil. The cross, the crucifixion, was the greatest evil to ever happen in history, but the ones who nailed him to the cross are also the most guilty people in all of history and the most responsible to God in all of history. And so he says, yes, the Son of Man must be betrayed. It must happen. It has to happen this way. But he doesn't let him off the hook. He doesn't say, because it is fulfilling God's sovereign plan, he's not going to be punished. No. He says, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. He is, in other words, he will be held accountable eternally for this sin. By the way, the same thing could be said of every unbeliever in this world. Every person who comes to the end of their life and does not confess Christ as Lord and Savior, it would have been better if that person had not been born. Why is that? Because hell is eternal. Hell is, is awful. It is, it is a punishment by the wrath of Almighty God that does not ever mitigate. It does not go down. It just keeps going forever and ever and ever. As long as heaven lasts, is the same, dis same length of time that hell lasts. So those who die without Christ, literally, it would have been, born, it would have been better if they would not even come into this world and not even come to exist. And so he is by far declaring that Judas is guilty. He is by far declaring that even though Judas is being led by the sovereign hand of God, Judas is responsible for his own actions. And so people say, well, how do you reconcile that God is sovereign and that people are responsible for what they do? And they will answer for what they do. They say, how do you reconcile this? And Spurgeon famously said, you don't have to reconcile friends because both things are taught in the Scripture. God is sovereign and God does punish sin. You see that all in one verse in verse 21. Let me give you another example of that real briefly. Acts in the book of Acts, <clears throat> it's uh, chapter 2, verse 23. Acts chapter 2, actually verse 22, okay? Verse 22 says, Men of Israel, this is Peter preaching to the crowds after the death of and raising again of Jesus. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over by, now look at this, the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, and put him to death. In that one statement, Peter is saying, God orchestrated this whole thing, but you are guilty for putting him to death. You shouldn't have done it. You shouldn't have done it, even though it was God's plan. It's a mystery, isn't it? We don't have all the mental capability of understanding this fully. But suffice to say, God is sovereign. 100%. And man is responsible. 100%. You can't say the devil made me do it. You can't say, God, it was your plan all along. No. We are responsible for what we do. And God is sovereign over all things that happen. And now verse 22, the most shocking thing of all to them. While they were eating, middle of the Passover meal, he took some bread, which... Everybody had at every Passover meal. He took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, take it. This is my body. Boy, he's stepping out of context, isn't he? If you know what the Passover is all about, it's all about celebrating what God did. What God the Father, what Yahweh did 1,500 years ago. And he, he takes the bread of the Passover. Everybody knew what the bread meant. 
It meant the Israelites baked bread in a hurry, ready to get out of there in a hurry. And he takes the bread of the Passover and says, this is my body. What? That was scandalous. That was shocking. What is happening here is so amazingly huge. This right here is the end of the Old Covenant and the beginning of the New Covenant. Praise His name. The last legitimate Passover, the first legitimate Lord's Supper. And let me just describe how shocking this would be. It would be sort of like us. We've been, we've been Americans for 200 and something years. Almost 250 years. If I were to say, you know the American flag, the stars and the stripes, the red, white, and blue. You know the flag? Actually, all that stuff, all the symbols of the flag, that's really about me. That's really all about me. <laughs> that would be shocking. That would be boastful. That would be pompous. It would be ridiculous. Jesus is essentially saying, in all those, 15 year, those 1,500 years of what we talked about with God rescuing the Israelites, I'm, I'm now going to give it a meaning, and it's all about me. It's all about my body. All of that was, was about Jesus, about me. Unbelievable. He says, take this bread, this is my body. When he'd taken a cup, again, one of the three times they drank wine in the Passover, this is the cup. When he'd taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I'll never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What is going on here? He's completely reshuffling the Passover. He is adding meaning to it and saying it's all about Him. This is my body. This is my blood of the covenant. Well, what covenant? God never talked about a covenant in which you drink blood. In fact, God said in Leviticus, Thou shalt not eat the lifeblood of an animal. So what's happening here? This is the new covenant. This is Jesus inaugurating something incredible and something brand new. The people of God who come to God by faith. By faith alone. And, and, and the church would understand this is the first Lord's Supper, the first communion. And the church has had many names for this throughout the years, right? They've called it the Eucharist. What does Eucharist mean? It means the giving of thanks. We come that from verse 22, after a blessing. This is when they said, I bless you, O Lord, giver of all things. And they gave thanks for the elements there that day. Some call it communion. That's appropriate too. It's where we commune with the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit. Some have mistakenly said, well, he said, this is my body. This is my blood. Some have literally taught in her church history that the actual body of Christ comes into the bread and the actual blood of Christ comes into the wine and that it's somehow a, a, a mysterious transformation of the elements into the real body and the real blood of Christ. That's taking it way too far. Because the disciples knew when he said, this is my blood of the covenant, it's not his physical blood being poured out into the cup. They didn't drink blood. That was forbidden by God. It's something like this. If I have a, a picture, which I do, and I said, this, this is my family. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's saying, you see this bread? This is my body. I mean, it's not like I have my family stuck in my wallet, okay? They're not all that small. This is a representation of my family. So Jesus says, this is my body. He would say later, do this in remembrance of me. That's what it is. It's remembering who he is and what he has done. This is my body. This is my blood of the covenant. And he says, which is poured out for many. It had not happened yet. It had not happened yet. It would be the next day. Literally, it would be hours later. 
that Jesus would die on the cross and he would spill his blood all over the place and that blood would be the penalty, the payment for the sins of many. And he says in verse 25, Truly I say to you, I'll never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so the Lord's Supper was inaugurated that day at that very hour. And it's something that we will, we will celebrate to proclaim the Lord's death, the Bible says, until He comes. When He comes, we're going to have a real meal, okay? He is going to drink with us. He's going to eat with us. We're going to have the banquet of the ages, the church, all of God's people with Jesus Christ the Son, the one who bought us all under the new covenant. Verse 26 says, After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. What does that mean? It simply means they sang a hymn. It means they sang Psalm 118 and Psalm 119. They didn't sing Blessed Assurance and, you know, what a day that will be. They sang one of the Psalms. Why? Because that's what you do. At the Passover, you sing a song. And then they went out to the Mount of Olives. It's, it's, it's ratcheting up more and more and more. This is the most explicit foreshadowing yet that came out of Jesus' mouth. He's saying to them all, one of you is going to betray me, and I'm about to go to my death to pay for the sins of many. And they still didn't understand that. But are you glad he did? Are you glad that Jesus came not just to show us what we need to do, but that He came to die for us? Because we can't do what God asks us to do. We fail. We need not a, a, a leader. We need not just a teacher. But we need a Savior. Because God said, do this and you shall live. And mankind for centuries has tried and tried and tried and failed. By the keeping of the law, the Bible says in Galatians, nobody will be justified. But we're justified. We're forgiven. We're saved. We're taken to heaven to be a part of God's family by faith in Christ alone. That's what the new covenant is all about. Not by birth line, not by heritage, not by ethnicity, not by the keeping of the law, but simply by believing on Jesus Christ, by asking Him to forgive you, committing your life to Him, and being united with Him. That's how we are saved. That's how we are taken away from the wrath of God. That's the new covenant. You just can't, I just can't stop talking about this because this is what the whole Bible is about. We're getting, we're getting toward the center here. We're getting to the very middle of it all. The whole midpoint of what everything in the Bible is teaching and looking ahead to and looking back at. It is all about the death and the work of Jesus Christ. And I just have to ask again, do you know Him? Have you received His forgiveness? Have you accepted His gift of eternal life into your life and your heart? It is simply received by faith, believing on Him, and you will be saved. If you know the salvation, oh, for heaven's sake, keep telling people. Keep spreading the good news because He is coming soon. His banquet is sooner now than it was last week. It's sooner now than it ever has been. Lift up your eyes. Your redemption draws near. He is right at the door and He is coming soon and His reward is with Him. Amen? Amen. Let's be ready. And let's keep telling everybody about what He's done for them. Let's pray together.